Yeah, thank you very much for staying here bravely until the last day. Yesterday was exhausting. I'm really happy to see so many of you for this last lecture. And today, we will put things together that we learned in the first and the second lecture. So that was a didactic strategy I did with the small caveats that I really have to ask you to pay close attention and maybe try to remember what we did in the last two lectures for the first part of today. Because today, the main topic is extensions, applications, and also some loose threads. This will be mostly more high level, more intuitive than the last two lectures. But in the beginning, I still owe you something very important. I owe you a proof that our things, the things I'm sharing with you, the techniques, actually are trustworthy and do the things we want on an efficient level. So the first part of today's talk will actually be a quick recapitulation to help you remind, remember what we did so far. And then we will do a proof of the main convergence guarantee. This is going to be the centerpiece where we really show that these randomized measurements can predict very many observables in a tractable and efficient manner. And then afterwards, I'm going to switch gears. I will briefly talk about other strategies, similar mindset, but different setups for different types of estimation problems. I will also talk about error mitigation, which is very important in today's noise devices. And I want to like be really, in the end, go to a higher level and reinterpret these randomized measurements, these classical shadows, as a new type of data format. A new type of data format that may help us to combine quantum experiments with powerful classical machine learning tools to really learn how to explore the quantum realm on upcoming large quantum simulators. And this is actually what excites me the most, and I think this is a good way to end this lecture. But before getting there, Let's do the busy work. And here is the recapitulation. Again, I think it's very important. The big vision is we want to learn many things of a large quantum system in a tractable, scalable, and trustworthy fashion. Last time, we dealt with many large and tractable, <coughs> but the trustworthiness is something I still owe you. A proof that this all works. And here is kind of like the procedure we did in the last lecture, these randomized state approximations. So we have a large unknown quantum state, let's say on any qubits, and we want to learn something about it. And in order to explore the Hilbert space, all directions of Hilbert space, we include a layer of single qubit gates that go randomly, either in the Z basis, X basis, or Y basis. This is something we assign randomly, and then we perform single qubit measurements to get a bit string of outcomes. This bit string is random, but the underlying distribution knows something about the unknown quantum state. And this was the key element we identified to start Monte Carlo approximations of the large system. And the way this works is to take the individual bit strings and remember the unitary we did to build these single qubit approximations of the unknown quantum system that are designed exactly in a way so that if we were to repeat this many, many times, it would converge to the unknown state. But because this is now an n qubit state, we have to come up with an n qubit Monte Carlo approximation. We call this a classical shadow. And we achieve this by just taking tens of products of these single qubit guys. And this is one of the main features because this Monte Carlo approximation is very efficient. It's just a tensor product. There's no correlation. So we can store it efficiently and we can process it efficiently. And the way we do data processing afterwards, for example, maybe we're interested in many different observables traced in a product with the unknown quantum system, whatever it is. We just do empirical averaging, frequency estimates, or my preferred term is Monte Carlo approximations. We use this to generate, generate a random classical shadow, and then we start 
all these estimation procedures, which, which are just sums of different classical shadows divided by the number of terms, and we just insert them in each of them in parallel, and then we keep going. We run the experiment again, we get a second point, we update all of them. And then, the way we constructed these Monte Carlo approximation last time, I hope you are convinced that if we do this infinitely often, we will converge the true observables. This is the task, the target. But the million dollar question for me is always, how many of these samples do we need? When does this convergence happen? Because asymptotic guarantees are nice, but you never know when asymptotic kicks in. So this is the result I still owe you. And here's the main theorem. If I have independent classical shadows, Monte Carlo approximations in the same way as you saw on the previous slide, this structure and a collection of observables that are omega local. So this is the assumption I need to prove strong convergence guarantees. I really assume that the observables only act non-trivially on omega qubits and not on all n qubits. Then what we will prove today is that the number of Monte Carlo samples, the number of shots we need in order to get epsilon close for all these observables at the same time, so the maximum deviation is at most epsilon, scales logarithmically in the number of observables, this is great, inverse quadratically in the desired accuracy, this is bad, but unavoidable for quantum technologies because this is essentially a short noise factor that we can't easily get rid of, and we have to pay a price, an exponential in omega, but remember that omega is the locality of our observables and not the total number of qubits. The total number of qubits doesn't appear here at all. So this result looks the same whether you do it for four qubits or 253,000. It's really only the omega that matters. So how do we prove such a thing? I want to do a simplified proof sketch to convey the main ideas with as little notation as possible and I ask you to pay close attention and complete the argument for yourself in your head. But in order to convey the main gist, I will assume that my observables are only too local. An extension to omega is straightforward. And I will in addition assume that our observables are just tensor products of Pauli matrices. That makes it all so easier. You can do it more generally, it's just a bit more work. For example, decompose a general omega local observable into a linear combination of polymeuses. And to avoid notational overburdening, I look at a special simple case where the first observable is just a polymatrix on the first qubit, a polymatrix on the second qubit, and because it's too local, that's it, and it does nothing everywhere else. And the second observable is maybe a polymatrix on the second qubit, a polymatrix on the third qubit, nothing else. A bit like the Heisenberg coming to me. This doesn't matter because I hope you can convince yourself soon that the position where these non-trivial polymatrices are doesn't matter at all. The idea is always the same. But here it's kind of easiest to see. Now let me write down the Monte Carlo estimator with one sample for the first observable. And now I just have to, decide, have to kind of like insert the definition of row hat, which is up here, up there. And remember that this is a nice tensor product. And the definition of the first observable, which is here, which is also a nice tensor product. And the cool thing about objects that are tensor products is when you multiply them and take the trace, it becomes the product of the traces. This is a nice feature of uncorrelated tensor products. So what this big inner product is, in a very, very large space, it really factorizes into single qubit products with traces. This is multilinear algebra. And you can see that because our first observable only has non-trivial polyterms in the first and second time, and has identity everywhere else, it really looks like a single qubit poly shadow for the first qubit with the polymatrix, a single qubit poly shadow for the second qubit, the second guy here, with this guy, and then we have traces with the identity. 
And now we can use the observation that we did last time, or that you can quickly check for yourself, is that if I take the trace of any such guy, I would get one. Because it's kind of three times the pure state, minus an identity matrix, three minus two is one. And you can see what's happening. All these terms don't matter. It all compresses to just the trace in a product on the first qubit and the second qubit, which is the qubits that matter for this observable. And I hope you can complete this argument in your head that it doesn't really matter where these are. You always, always only have to look at the location where something non-trivial happens and you just forget every, everything else. And this is the reason why we won't see the big number of qubits. Because with this compression, by construction. And so really what we have to look at is how large can a trace in a product between a Pauli matrix and these unphysical semi-qubit objects become. And if you actually do this, I spelled it out here, this is again a Pauli matrix, this is just the first classical shadow term, this is the second classical shadow term. <coughs> now we can use just some tricks. Pauli matrices are traceless. This is probably something you know. And so the trace in a product with the identity matrix doesn't matter. It vanishes. So I just have to look at this guy. And I can rewrite this as an expectation value of the first bit string with a rotated poly matrix here. I kind of like pulled the action of the unitary U from the state to the, uh, to the observable. Schrodinger to Heisenberg. And here I forgot something. I have these factors of three. I have one for this and one for this, so there, would, there should be a three squared here, which I forgot to write. I'm very sorry. But I hope you can complete it in your head. And this three squared will be related to the four over omega here. Kind of like the size of these objects now scales with three to the locality but it's again independent of the number of qubits. And if you complete this now, you can really compute for yourself that there's really only three different options of what this term can be. <coughs> it's either three squared plus one, if this guy is an eigenvector of this rotated polymatrix and an eigenvector of this rotated polymatrix, it can be a minus one if one of them is a plus eigenvector and one of them is a minus eigenvector, or it can be zero if you rotate it in the wrong basis, which is exactly the insights we had in the first lecture, remember? If we measure the x basis, we don't learn anything about the y basis, and this is now here in the formalism automatically included by setting this term to zero. So it's really zero if we're in the wrong basis, and if we're in the right basis, there's two options, plus one and minus one, and if you complete this argument, it's really minus one to the parity. This is the type of estimators we had in the first lecture. So here, I just showed you that I was actually maybe deceiving you because the story I told in lecture one is the same as the story I told you in lecture two. It really adds up. And now, we know what these types of individual summons look like. It's a random variable that is often zero if we don't hit the right observable. But if we hit it, it can be plus three squared or minus three squared. And because of the construction last week, uh, sorry, last term, uh, sorry, last on Wednesday, we know that in expectation, if I were to take the average of this guy, taking into account that it is sometimes zero, would give me the actual expectation value of the observable for the large guy. And now we're in familiar territory. Each of these Monte Carlo estimators is an independent shot, like in the first lecture, and we know that it can be at most plus nine, at least minus nine, and often zero. Yes? So this plus, minus one, and zero is essentially an effect of unbiased basis. Yes, really. exactly. Very good. You can also feel that as we measure in three different unbiased bases, and the poly observables are diagonal exactly one, and vanish in the other. Thank you very much. But I taught you on Monday how to deal with that. We just do this hefting inequality. We use these concentration inequalities to convert the asymptotic convergence guarantee 
into a fixed number of shots that we need to approximate. So we really have a collection of random variables that are contained in minus 3 squared, 0 or 3 squared, and they are independent, which is very good in this framework. And then we also know that in expectation, if we repeat this infinitely often, we will get exactly the object we're interested in, regardless of the underlying state. And if you have this, I hope you believe me that the proof strategies from Monday are enough to complete this argument. Because I did exactly examples like this. And I showed you that for a single observable, the number of steps you need scales quadratically in the largest size. So it's just hurting inequality, inverse quadratically in the accuracy, and nothing else. And now the last thing we have to do is to take into account that we're not interested in only one observable, but in many of them. But there are also told you a trick on how to solve that. This was this union bound argument. The probability of something bad happening is small or equal than the probability that something bad happens in occasion one, plus something bad happens in occasion two, plus something bad happens in occasion three. Right? And because perfecting these concentration bounds give you exponential convergence, I can treat this number of different bad events L and can compensate for it with a log factor because the log factor appears in the number of shots we do and that goes into an exponential. And so it can really kill us. And if you complete this line of arguments, looking at the lecture notes from Monday at the slides, you will see that you will get a scaling like this. Admittedly, if you complete this argument, you won't get a four to the omega, I think you will get a nine to the omega, but please trust me, there's better versions than her inequality. Hurfdick's inequality is just one of the most basic concentration inequalities. If you work longer in the subjects like I do, then there's better versions that give you better argue, better concentration, but the underlying gist is the same. We really explore and exploit the randomness in our Monte Carlo samples. So this hopefully convinces you, or at least provides you a route for you to yourself proof that the ideas I shared with you rigorously converge much, much quicker than you might expect. Is there questions or comments at this point? Yes, Alain? Why is it... Okay. Hi. Um, why, then, following your proof, mm -hmm. the range of the random variable form of P should be like 2 times 3 squared? I have to give you like three squares instead of four. So what, where the four comes from? Um, the three square comes from the fact that I only did this proof sketch for two local observables. Yeah, yeah but why is not four? Just like the if, you, if you want to do the four, you have to do a more general analysis for arbitrary observables, which is more tricky than expanding it in simple cancer products. So you have to look at the more general case. And then you have to do have to use a more general concentration inequality, which is called the Bernstein inequality, which doesn't only rely on boundedness of the random variables, but also a guarantee of the variance. Okay. So you use additional information about this random process that is admittedly not completely trivial to derive, to just get kind of like an improvement in this term. So we use more information about the Monte Carlo process that you can compute in a more general scenario with a more general and stronger concentration inequality that doesn't only take into account the size of the random variables, this is enough for hurting, but also the variance. Okay. Thank you. Or in other words, I'm using bigger guns. Thanks. But this was very helpful. Thank you very much. And with that, I hope, to, I hope it was able for me to convince you that it's possible to prove things about this. And my intent here was to try to convince you that this is not rocket science. This is something you could easily learn yourself. And the, the remarkable features that make this happen, rather simple arguments for strong concentration arguments, is really the fact that we generate independent classical shadows 
that have the correct expectation value by default. And independence is a very, very powerful source if you want to prove things. This is one of the main reasons why my lectures might be a bit more primitive than Gaussia's. Because Gaussia cannot afford to ask for independence, and then her arguments need to be much more mature. But here, we have good reasons to assume independence, and then we can get a long way with relatively simple and scalable arguments. Okay, this, I hope, convinces you that the methods I'm teaching you maybe or not, are mathematically provably trustworthy. You have bounds that tell you how often you have to repeat your experiments to be sure that you epsilon approximate things you know. And in practice, it can be better. Because it's really a mathematical theorem that tells you if you do this, if you invest this type of short budget, then you're fine. But you can be lucky and it happened much earlier. And this is what we see in numerics. Okay? And with that, I'm done with kind of like the basic formalism, the basic classical shadow formalism I wanted to show to you, which is the most important one for near term, which is really these localized single qubit random measurements. And now I want to switch gears, go to a higher level, and just briefly tell you something, some more, let's say, high level ideas on how to use the same mindset for different applications. And here, I just want to like use a visual analogy. In all the lectures so far, we had an unknown quantum state, and in order to learn something about it, we did single shot measurements on all the qubits, and before we included a layer of single qubit gates. So this is really a local setting, where we treat the qubits independently and rotate them independently. And from this point of view, it shouldn't come as a surprise that this setup is very good for predicting local things. This is just what I proved on the last slide. The number of short scales exponentially in a locality. So it's good if you have very local things, many local things, but if you have non-local things, it gets worse. And this is maybe not surprising, right? Because these random unitaries only change single qubit orientations and not multi qubit interactions. And this is another story that I could tell. Yeah, here's again the take home message. If you take these local random unitaries, then you get a rigorous framework that is scalable, that is good for predicting local properties. But now, we can start thinking, maybe we can think of different setups that are good for different things. For example, I could think about what happens if I don't do random single qubit rotations, but a large random unitary that scrambles information across all qubits. Like think of global random evolution of a deep quantum circuit. Then this is now a different beast, right? It's completely non-local, and it has the potential to connect far apart regions because it is a big unitary. And the nice thing about the framework I taught to you is that you can do the same kind of analysis for these types of global measurements. You do a randomized global measurement, you remember the unitary you had, and then you make it a classical ansatz that tends a product of the computational basis state you've seen. This is kind of the starting point was it also last time, which is say we measure a single shot bit string, and our approximation is, well, that bit string rotated into the right basis. So our classical approximations now also have a big unitary that we have to unravel. And then you can again analyze whether this is a good Monte Carlo approximation, and the answer will be no, because it will again have a depolarizing effect. Like in last lecture, you saw these nice pictures, that if you make these types of ansets, you get the right direction, but you're forced inside state space because you average kind of like different basis measurement. And lo and behold, the same is true here, but on a global level. So this is exactly the same story, but in the global big Hilbert space, where we forget that we had individual qubits to begin with. And we can counteract for that by inverting a global depolarized channel. This is really the same argument we did last week with this equation identity. It also works for n qubit systems if this unitary is random and deep enough, if it is a scrambling unitary. And if you do these kind of things, you can completely analyze this. This was actually part of our first paper. You will learn that this 
is good for estimating global properties, which is maybe intuitive, because we really tailor the type of randomization we do to global features. Okay? And this is kind of like an easier, uh, an interesting alternative that you can use to, for example, estimate fidelities with n qubit states or correlation functions or topological properties, anything where you think it should scale with the system size. These type of randomized measurements are capable of unraveling this information and present it to you in a very efficient manner. In fact, the rigorous theorems look the same as I told you just now, with the discrepancy that we now don't have an exponential scaling in locality, because we have non-local operations to begin with, but instead the cost depends on the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the observables, which is a very non-local property. And this is, for example, very good to estimate fidelities with pure states, because in this case the observable would be a pure state itself and a Hilbert-Schmidt norm 1. So if you, if you invest 10,000 of these shots, you can estimate 2 to the 10,000 different pure state fidelities if you want to. However, here, there's some new things and some things to be careful about. Remember, what, we, what did we aspire to? We wanted to find tractable randomized measurements that are scalable and trustworthy. I just kind of like try to convince you that this is a trustworthy setup. Is it tractable? Would you be able to implement big unitaries on your quantum architecture? And with big, I mean deep, polynomially in the number of qubits. This is not near term. Because here, in order to have a global scrambling unitary that connects all the qubits, you need unitaries of depth at least the number of qubits. And this is something that we hope to get there, but we are not there yet. So this is connected to fault tolerance. And so for now, it's not a near-term protocol, at least not in the regimes that I'm interested in, where we have hundreds of qubits. For three, four qubits, you can do that. And it might be an interesting idea. Another question, does it have efficient storage and post-processing? Can we efficiently store big unitaries on our classical computers? Well, not necessarily, right? We can store a circuit decomposition, which is efficient, but in the post-processing, we really run into problems, right? Because our classical approximation now has the quantum circuit, and if you want to compute the Monte Carlo approximation, here it's not clear to can, right? Maybe we would need a quantum computer for that, if it is a really large unitary. But there's a trick. There's a certain family of unitary circuits that are scrambling and can be stored as well as computed efficiently. And these are Clifford circuits. Circuits that only contain Hadamard and phase and xenons. These play a crucial role in Fernando's analysis. Fernando Brandao uses Clifford circuits for error correction but an interesting feature of Clifford circuits that was developed by Gottesman and Neil tells you that you can simulate so-called stabilizer or Clifford circuits efficiently on a classical computer. Maybe you've heard about this. This is the reason why Clifford circuits are not universal. Everything that starts with the computational basis state and uses the Clifford circuit can be efficiently computed classically using a number of bits that is only quadratic in the number of qubits. And this saves us here. Because this is exactly what it is. So this setting, although it's global and it looks very complicated, it is actually scalable on classical computers in the post process. The only thing that keeps us from using those is the fact that we are, we, our gates are not good enough yet to implement them reliably on a quantum computer. Okay, but this, I could have told exactly this story and it would look very, very similar, but we now have global random unitaries, and they are good at estimating global properties. And just to show you that I'm not joking here, and here are some numerical examples, some numerical experiments that we did when we first developed this framework, where we compared ourselves to the best 
method that was on the market back then, and this was neural network quantum state tomography by Leandro Arolita and friends. I guess many of you know Leandro. They used machine learning to get an empirical reconstruction method without proof techniques, proof guarantees. And here, we really did a simple example. <coughs> we prepared a GHG set on n qubits, did the reconstruction techniques, and then computed the fidelity with that GHC state. Okay? Like really a typical experiment. Pretend to have a GHC state here in a classic computer, execute the two protocols, neural network quantum state tomography, and classical shadows with global random clipboards, and then count the number of shots you need until you are very close to one in the fidelity with the GHC state. Okay? So, GHC state, estimation protocol, fidelity with the GHC state. And here you can see that Leandro's technique is actually very good because it only increases scales linearly in the number of qubits, which is good scaling if you're interested in estimation <coughs> properties. But the orange line looks even better, right? This is us. Because in our arguments, the total number of qubits never enters, right? We always get something that is independent in the number of qubits, and you can really see here. And I just want to put your attention to the x axis, which is the number of qubits. We did these numerical simulations from two qubits up to 120, using these cortis trees. So this plot not only highlights that the resource cost can be independent of the number of qubits for fidelities, it also shows that we can run these things for up to 120 qubits and it was actually no problem. We could have done to 10,000. So with this Clifford approximation trick, we in principle have an efficient estimation technique. We just have to find out how to do these random Clifford on our quantum matrix. And the take-home message is global random unitaries are good for global properties like a fidelity with a global GFC. Are there questions or comments here? And now, it's everybody's game, right? I showed you kind of like, an, for me it's a nice story for local measurements, and I hopefully could convince you that we know how to do global measurements as well. Now we can all join the party and think about kind of like estimation schemes that maybe represent the symmetry of the, stru or the structure of the objects we care about. And one obvious way to implement between these is to maybe look at random circuits that are not very deep, but maybe shallow. This would be one way to interpolate between local and global randomized measurements. Just take random circuits of increasing depth. This is something that is very active in the community right now. Yes, Claudia? I have a question about this comparison with Leandro's method. Yes. Because, so at least in QKD, if it's like it's in the same order of magnitude on the number of experiments, yes. but is it good? Like uh, you're forcing me to do something I didn't want to do. Leandro's method is, is a different problem. We kind of like tricked. We made a nasty experiment where we prepared the GHG state with a minor space, which is a, a state that is maximally far away from the GHG state, and asked the same question. And here you can see what happens with the probability of the Z error. So kind of like here we have kind of like, we just fix the number of qubits and ask the two methods, what is the fidelity with the GHC plus state when you actually measure the GHC minus state with a certain probability. And you can see our points go linearly down as they should. If the probability of the Z error increases, the fidelity should go down linearly, right? Leandro's method say that's one. So this is a problem with machine learning it sometimes confidently gives you completely wrong solutions. <laughs> but, but, okay. <laughs> but then just to understand if this is a scaling that you would claim is still an advantage, even though it's the same order of magnitude in your framework, or...? Well, like one of them doesn't scale with the number of qubits and the other one does. Okay. <laughs> you can call it the same order of magnitude, that is true of course, but I think a constant and a linear line have a difference. Even though both are great. And this was actually one of the main motivations for us to try to come up with proof techniques. Because machine learning is great, but sometimes it can really deceive you and you have no idea. And this is one concrete example where that happened. 
Let me now move on to talking about errors. We already saw a bit about that, a lot about this in the lecture. This is the main reason why Fernando is working so hard to kind of like make quantum computers happen. Our quantum computers make errors. And it's also the reason why we can't implement these things yet on dozens of qubits. But maybe we can do some sort of error mitigation, get away with kind of like the noise that we have in the current devices. And here, I want to provide high-level intuition that randomized measurements, doing a random unitary and then measuring, can be used for error mitigation. So they are naturally well suited for error mitigation techniques. And here is the high-level argument. We always start with an unknown quantum system, then apply a random evolution, and then we measure. And this evolution is chosen randomly. In the local case, it was random single qubit unitaries. In the global case, it was random global unitaries. But both of them, both of these settings have a nice feature in the sense that if I were to multiply two of these circuits, I would get a circuit of the same form. If I multiply two layers of single qubit gates, I can compress them to one layer of single qubit gates. And if I multiply two global circuits, I also get again a global circuit. It's a bit longer. And if I choose these random unitaries from a random family that has a group structure, like the Clifford group or like the single qubit Pauli group, then the product of these two will also be in the same group. And now if I choose randomly from the group, it doesn't matter if I kind of also multiply with another fixed random unitary. Okay? So kind of like this entire structure that I showed you, under the hood, I was keeping that information from you, actually uses group theory in the creation of the unitary circuits. And group theory is one way to compute these inverse operations that you need to turn your approximations of the state, just your post-measurement state, into a faithful Monte Carlo approximation. These inverse depolarizing channels actually follow from group theory. But this tells you something stronger when you really think about error mitigation and benchmarking, because maybe some of you have heard that group structure is also important when you want to characterize errors in your devices. Randomized benchmarking is one of the most famous protocols that uses the Clifford group structure to get approximate error rates. And the idea is that you use randomization to turn any type of noise, regardless what it is, into an effective noise that is simple. For example, if I do a global random <coughs> unitary and then an error happens and I undo the global random unitary, then I effectively depolarize the noise to a single depolarizing channel because I randomly change bases every time and so the noise channel doesn't know what to do. And you basically trick it and you force it to have an effective depolarizing effect. And here we do the same. It's actually something that I didn't notice, but Steve Flamia noticed. Because we apply a random unitary on the physical system, and then we undo the random unitary in the classical post-processing. So this is like a quantum classical application of a randomized benchmarking protocol. And it turns out that exactly these methods allow you to first effectively turn any noise you have into either a global depolarization if you had a global unitary, or a so-called effective Pauli channel if you have random single qubit rotations. These are really the same ideas that some of you might have heard from randomized compiling or randomized benchmarking to characterize this. And there, they physically apply the rotation and then physically unapply it. Here, we just do it on a classical post-processing level. But the underlying ideas are really the same. And so what you can do is before you actually do your randomized measurements to create Monte Carlo samples, you do a calibration technique. You start not with an unknown state that you care about, but with a simple state that you know. For example, a computational zero state. And then you do your protocols, and then you check how well your Monte Carlo approximations approximate the fidelity with that unknown state. And this is going to tell you the effective depolarizing rates in the individual qubits, and then you can undo that in the Monte Carlo samples themselves. You will get an additional depolarizing effect. And this means that I can just adjust my Monte Carlo samples 
to go a bit further outside of the broad sphere, if you think, in order to really counteract the effective errors that happen. Okay? I know that this is now a bit complicated, especially for the younger ones of you. One line summary, many people think about benchmarking quantum gates. One of the most successful techniques and reliable techniques is to use randomization to turn difficult errors into simple errors that you can learn. And these randomized measurement protocols do exactly the same by construction. And so you can really counteract and mitigate noise sources in a reliable way. And here's a nice numerical example from Steve Flamier's group, where they really looked kind of like the transverse field icing model, details don't matter, don't matter, but these are kind of local observables that they estimate, where they assume that they have noise in the random unitaries and in the measurements. And the blue, the red dots are the standard shadow protocol I explained to you, standard Monte Carlo sampling. And what is telling that you see is that they kind of like go in the right direction, but they're a bit shrinked. For all of these observables, it's just a constant shrink. This is a signature of a depolarizing effect. It just pushes you closer into the blob sphere, and then your observable does not become quite as large. And the blue dots are their robust shadows, where they first did this calibration stage to learn the effective depolarizing effects, and then just adjusted the Monte Carlo samples accordingly, which is as efficient as the original protocol. And you can see that it tracks the true underlying observables perfectly. So this is really, I think, an interesting and remarkable feature of randomized measurements that we, who invented it, didn't know at first. This was really a community effort that was Steve Lamia making us aware that the protocol might have been smarter than we thought. And so error mitigation is possible with these things. Take home message randomization washes out noise, turns difficult noise into simpler noise, and this opens the door for efficient error mitigation and even correction at the end when you actually care about your predictions. Now, just very, very quickly, so far we looked at predicting observables, linear functions in the density matrix. Right? This was all we did. But the entire framework I'm sharing with you naturally extends to nonlinear functions, most notably polynomials. One example is the purity of the density matrix, which is the trace of the density matrix squared. This is 1 if the state is a pure state, and it's 1 over 2 to the n if you have the maximum in each state. But you can see this is clearly a non-linear function in the density matrix. How would we estimate this? Well, I rewrite, let me start from right to left, I rewrite trace rho squared as trace rho times rho. And now I realize, well, trace rho times rho is just trace of the expectation value of my Monte Carlo approximator times the expectation value of my Monte Carlo approximator estimator. And now I can use the fact that two independent random variables factor if I take the expectation value. If I have one random variable times another random variable and the two are independent, then the expectation value is the product. I just do that. I just approximate this expectation value times expectation value by taking the trace between different Monte Carlo approximations because they are statistically independent by definition. And so I can just average the purity by taking the empirical average over all distinct pairs of shadows that I've taken. And it's going to guarantee to converge to the right thing because of independence. And because we had this nice tentacular structure before, or the Clifford structure, you can always compute these traces in a product efficiently. And the only thing that you might wonder now is what about the efficiency? Is it more expensive to compute polynomial functions? And the answer is yes, but it only grows polynomially in the degree. So estimating a 20th order polynomial is only polynomially more expensive as estimating a linear function. What matters here again if you do the localized protocol is how global are your multi, kind of like your polynomials. And here, for those of you who are interested, there's a general recipe of how to transform a general polynomial into 
an expression that you can approximate with Monte Carlo samples. You always write it as a linear observable in the tensor product, and then you replace each tensor factor with an independent classical shadow, and you average over everything. Okay, and this works, this actually works in experiments, and for example, allowed us for the first time to detect mixed state entanglement in a random quantum quench on an ion trap quantum simulator. And we achieved that by computing purities and third or third moments of the density matrix to really find a criterion for entanglement in mixed states. And so whenever kind of like these lines goes above this one, we know that entanglement has to be in the system. And here the x-axis depicts time in your quantum quench on 10 qubits, and this kind of like tells you whether this system and this system is entangled with each other. And you can see a nice story, because first, it needs some time. It starts in the product state, so the entanglement builds up. You can see it goes up, and then sometimes it can go down again. But you can really watch entanglement dynamics of many body <coughs> systems that are very mixed, with these types of ideas. And underlying which is the Monte Carlo approximation for polynomials. Okay? And for those of you who are interested, just follow this recipe to transform a polynomial that you might be interested in into something that you can easily do with Monte Carlo approximation techniques. So the take home message is this entire framework as a natural extension to approximating polynomials and all you need to know is that expectation values of product of independent random variables factorized. It's a basic fact from what we did here. And with that, I'm almost at the end. I now want to talk a bit more visionary about maybe a more high level understanding of what we've been doing and maybe routes towards the future that excite me very much. And in order to start that with, I really started to view classical shadows or this Monte Carlo approximation that you take as a data format to store information about a quantum state. An alternative data format that hasn't been used before. So for me the most natural comparison is a comparison with matrix product states. I don't know if you've heard about them, but this is an efficient way of storing and manipulating certain many-body quantum systems. But really, before, we mainly use these matrix product states and matrix product operators to reason about quantum systems with numerical experiments. This is a way to store and process quantum many-body dynamics. And the classical shadows that I'm sharing with you right now were really developed to interpret and use data that was taken from a quantum experiment. But this is what we set out. I, we didn't write down state uh, descriptions from the beginning, but we always had an actual quantum state that we want to measure. And then we did randomized measurements and got very, very efficient kind of like Monte Carlo approximations that if we were to average them, would allow us to predict very many different properties. And for me, this is not really a data format. I have a very, very simple uncorrelated object if I do these local measurements. And I know that if I average them up, I can learn a lot about the underlying state. This is also what we proved about. And this is very similar to matrix product states in a way, but in another way it's not. Because existing state approximation techniques are always physical. This is some constraint that I hear a lot. Kind of like typically you really want your objects to be physical in the sense that they are actual quantum states with trace one and no negative eigenvalues. The classical shadows are quite the opposite. They have trace one, at least, but they have super negative eigenvalues. So it's really unphysical, but there's kind of like an advantage. If you work with matrix product states, then you will quickly realize that these state approximations are not linear. If I add up two matrix product state representations of two quantum states, I don't get the matrix product state representation of the sum of the two states. Whereas in the classical shadow framework you do, because Born's rule is linear. I don't want to go into details, but if I have a classical shadow of one quantum system and a classical shadow of the other quantum of another quantum system, and I average them, I get a classical shadow of the average. Which is beautiful if you actually want to do some theory. It's kind of like really a linear approximation model. And, and this is I think the most interesting change of pace, 
if you have a traditional matrix product state approximation, it is accurate for all observables because it is a true representation of the underlying state. But they are only accurate or efficient for very, very restricted states. Maybe you've heard the term bond dimension in the context of matrix product states. And these representations are only efficient if you have a small bond dimension, which means that you can't have very high entanglement. So these really only represent a small corner of all possible states, but they do it exactly. And the classical shadows are exactly the opposite. They work for all states. In the entire lecture, we never cared about how difficult the state actually was. Right? This didn't matter. We cared about how hard are the observables. So kind of like this approximation works for all states conceivable, but maybe not for all observables. For example, we proved that it is only efficient for local observables. And there's a lot of local observables, but this is not everything, as it should, because quantum systems are complex, and so both have to fall short at some extent. But for me, this is kind of like really an interesting complement to the state of the art how most people reason about complicated quantum systems when they want to do data analysis, when they want to do machine learning, when they want to do some classical approximation techniques. And really, these matrix product states were developed to do numerics or theoretical arguments about quantum systems. And we developed quantum uh, classical shadows to really interpret quantum data. So data taken from an actual quantum experiment in a scalable fashion that also turned out to be linear. And for me, what excites me is that this can be the starting point of the entire pipeline where we start with an actual quantum device that can do cool quantum stuff. And then we use random rotations that we can do, followed with single qubit measurements to create a classical shadow approximation of the underlying quantum system. And this now has some quantum power because we use the quantum device to generate the states and perform the measurement. This is not necessarily efficiently similar. In interesting cases, it's not. But I spent a lot of time to hope to convey that this classical representation is efficient, it's smallish, but you could use it to predict many different things. Like again, if you want to predict L observables, you only need log L many shots. So this thing contains a lot of information in a very compressed way. So it's a compressed data. And instead of thinking ourselves hard, what do we want to estimate actually to learn interesting effects? Maybe we can use machine learning to do that. Like really use this as a tractable data format together with cutting edge machine learning techniques to not think ourselves about what the right observables are, but learn it. Think about binary classification of easy and hard quantum <coughs> systems. Now you have a pipeline that would allow you to do that with linear support vector machines on the classical machine learning side, for instance. And this is something we started to do in the context of an important quantum many-body physics problem, which is the ground state problem. I'm sure many of you have heard that, but that a problem is typically that you have an efficient classical description of a quantum many-body system in terms of Hamiltonian terms, like a lattice that tells you which qubit talks to which qubit, and parameters that tell you what the interactions look like. So this is an efficient representation of a quantum many-body system, and the million dollar question in quantum many-body physics is learn something about the associated ground state. And this is a very hard problem. We have complexity theoretic constructions, and we know that it shouldn't be possible to solve this problem efficiently going directly from a classical representation of the Hamiltonian to a classical representation of features of the associated ground state. There's somehow an exponential bottleneck behind here. But now with this new type of data format, we can think of new types of solutions where we don't solve this problem directly, but use machine learning insights. Maybe we can use some training data that tells us something about similar problems and their ground states. And now with classical shadows, we are even in the we can even prepare this type of training data on actual quantum architectures. Ask our experimental friends to physically cool down these systems and find ground states. Then we do classical shadows, we convert it into a machine readable form and teach a machine learning model to do that. To directly and efficiently extrapolate from a new description of the Hamiltonian to the ground state properties we have. 
But in order to do that, you really need a way to link a quantum experiment with a classical computer that does machine learning. And the randomized measurements do that. And so last year, in a collaboration with Robert Kwan, John Preston, and people from Amazon, we showed that this can work. And here is kind of like one example that we did. This is a so-called two-dimensional random Heisenberg model on 25 qubits. It's kind of these 25 qubits. You have Heisenberg type correlations here, and we choose the coupling strength randomly. And then you can ask some questions about the associated ground states. For example, how strongly are two spins or qubits correlated? And then you get correlation matrix that look like this. But a two-dimensional Heisenberg model, if you want to solve it the traditional way, is at least. And in order to get this table, we needed to fry some Amazon servers for several days to just run the DMRG approaches. What you see on the right-hand side is the predictions that we got with our machine learning model. There we use the Amazon resources to fry and do 10,000 solutions of this type of ground state problem for different random couplings, and then use the machine learning model to directly extrapolate a function that takes a new description of a new Hamiltonian and goes directly to the correlation matrix. And as you can see, it doesn't look that different. It's not perfect, but the, it's, it's in the right ballpark. And this is very expensive when you restart it. And this was very expensive in the beginning because we had to try 10,000 different Hamiltonian problems. But then afterwards, it's a simple function. It's a function that you efficiently can store on GitHub and really implement in seconds. And something that I'm proud of is that we managed to provide rigorous theory support. So in a paper that appeared last year, this one, we proved <laughs> under some physical assumptions on the type of Hamiltonian that all the resource costs involved in this entire pipeline only scale polynomially in the number of qubits. And this year, a follow-up work showed that this resource scaling actually went down to polylogarithmic. So really a polylogarithmic scaling in the number of units. And the key insight we use to come up with these guarantees is to use the fact that classical shadow approximations are linear and that machine learning models become linear estimation models in a certain regime. But I really think that this is an interesting way that maybe might point us into the future, like use these efficient data formats that are generated on real quantum devices and combine them fruitfully with machine learning to learn where we should look at in order to see the quantum realm happen. And this is what excites me and what I'm going to do in the next couple of years. And with that, I'm done. This is my last slide now. Just as a quick summary, remember that we're really living in interesting times. The quantum devices that we have today are all exciting and some of them really push the number of qubits to large and larger sizes. We have noisy quantum computers with hundreds of qubits today. And this really allows us to do interesting things for the first time. But we can only indirectly access this type of information. It doesn't work in the traditional way we learned. We don't see the density matrices directly. We can't compute the observables directly. Instead, we have short data and get random outcomes. And I hope that I con could convey in these three lectures that this is not necessarily a curse, but a blessing. Because randomness is very powerful when it comes to approximating many things of complicated objects. This is the realm of Monte Carlo sampling, and I showed you some tricks in order to come up with tractable and scalable learning protocols, and now not using observable estimation, but really learning, that come with rigorous performance guarantees. And they were typically in the form of approximating a very complicated object as an empirical average of much simpler guys, and we use quantum computers to generate these simpler guys efficiently. And then you saw last time that in the lab test in Innsbruck, this really converged very, very quickly. And the underlying motivation and vision is really to maybe sometimes stop thinking too hard and just throw a dice. It can make things much, much easier. And this can really also be a bridge between rigorous quantum theory. I don't know if you know that, but I was a diehard theorist until many years ago, uh, except a few years ago, and now I'm really excited about experiments, and I'm really excited to talk about it with experimentalists. So I think this can really be a fruitful combination between theory and experiment.
that can bring us as a community closer together. And with that, I'm done. Here's the big vision. And I really want to thank you for being here. I know that we now have a lot of options as younger and older people. There are thousands of tutorials online, and it's really becoming also more difficult for us lecturers and teachers to find an audience that is engaging. You could have just skipped my talks and watched like 100 videos by other people doing the same thing. So I really want to thank you for being here and for lending me your ears for these three lectures and for playing along and asking so many questions. It has been a privilege. Thank you. and other kinds of uh, analytical resources so that we can estimate error bounds on experimental things? Well, there's tons of literature. I'm sure like you have so recommendations, like if you have any special recommendations. Well, to be honest, in lecture two, I shared a, a tutorial from Penny Lane with you. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a markdown where you can play around with these things yourself. Mm -hmm. I think this is great. It's a new and engaging way of approaching the topic and there you can get intuition for yourself. If you're more interested in the types of tools that we use, because they're different and arguably simpler than what conventional statistics does, then I do have some lecture notes covering these topics, or some of these topics during my time at Caltech. You'll find it on my personal web page. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I, I didn't quite get what, why you use Clifford um, matrices for uh, estimating the global yes. things. I, I get that it's because it's scales better, but could you have used a different structure to do that? Uh, that's very difficult. Um, very good question. I'm kind of like, I hope you agree with me that kind of like a hard random unitary. A completely random unitary would do the job perfectly. Right? It's like as random as it can be, and I hope you can use like these beautiful integration formulas to compute everything like moments and get stronger bounds. But the problem is really that we, this is not a scalable method. You can't store it, you can't produce it, this is just kind of like a nice exercise in your head if you adhere to scalability standards. So you need something that is first a group, because kind of like these group averages are the only technique we have to analytically compute these expectation values. We don't want to do that numerically because that would be difficult. Okay, so we need a group. There's many interesting groups, but it turns out that if you want to actually invert, kind of like really find these depolarizing effects, where do I have it? Like here. What do you do? In order to kind of like compute the bias of what you would get if you just took the post-measurement state, it's actually, and you write it down as an integral, you will actually see that the unitary pops up four times. First, because kind of like this is a mixed state, so we have like actually two rotations, one U and one U dagger here, right? And we also have two rotations here, kind of like F going to mix the formulas, right? So we have unitary and F. But then in the underlying probability distribution, when I take the expectation value, Born's rule kicks in, I see the unitary again, right? Because this tells me the probability of obtaining a certain mixed thing with two times the unitary, and this tells me what we do on the inverse end. So you're forced to compute an integral over the harm measure with four unitaries appearing. Okay? And we, the Clifford group is the only nice group we know that achieves the same behavior as the harm measure for up to four unitaries. With Pauli's, I only would have the first two, and this is why we use Clifford. We can use the normal high integration techniques, which we know how to do, to get something analytical, and we can use Cortes Manil's to efficiently store it. We were really lucky. Does this answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any final question? Let me tell something and you say if you agree, disagree, yes, play on it. That probably generations of naive physicists learn from naive mathematicians that if they had 
the quantum stage, they could make all the, the all the big values and even larger statistics. And now we are at the time for smart quantum scientists, quantum computer scientists that learn from smart data scientists that we only need very good way of sampling. And it's much more efficient if we learn how to sample well, sample well, then to really try to reconstruct all the complexity of quantum states from this having that enough. Yes, I agree. And let me take the chance to rephrase it. I think the mathematicians that teach the physicists are not naive, and the physicists are, are, are not naive either. This is just the way we used to think about them. But with the advance in qubit sizes, we simply can't do that anymore. Even if I promised you, for one Kashasa bottle, I will tell you one entry of the density matrix, and now we do 100 qubits, I will be very rich, right? Because you would have to ask me four to the 100 times. And kind of like this simple complexity of just storing these objects is actually in itself already a problem. So I think it's not a conceptual problem, but just a scaling problem. First, I'd like to thank you for uh, very inspiring and didactic uh, lectures over these last years, or last days. <laughs> um, so, I understand that the motivation for your work is very clear, and you're considering um, for these discussions the digital quantum computers, architecture, or something that sort. <clears throat> but basically, I mean, motivated by this, this slide actually, the, the, the question about um, long-range relations and many body systems and so on. Um, so, I, I think maybe the simpler question is, have you thought about that? How, how do you do, how you go about, would go about applying those methods? Because you say, you see, for many body, if you're interested in many body quantum correlations, they're like Bose Einstein on the six square continuous. They don't quite fit into this framework. Of course, you can do something. Another option would be qubits, not necessarily qubits. So, how, how one go, I mean, if you thought about how you go about this, I mean, just okay. a general question. Excellent question. Like first, from qubits to qubits, this is something we are very much aware of, and this will be the starting project for my future PhD students. So we will do that starting October. Um, then, next question, when we go to BECs, kind of like I know that Tilman Esslinger at ETH Zurich and one of his former students in Vienna can now actually do random semi-qubit rotations in a BEC. This is something very new and excites me a lot because that means that the local classical shadows should actually be applicable to BECs. So this is exciting. And answering your third and most important question is that in analog quantum simulators or many body systems, you don't have gate control. And you can't just say, I do a random clipboard here, and I know what I'm doing, and then I kind of like undo it in the classical post-processing stage. This approach doesn't work, but the underlying intuition of doing something that scrambles quantum information so that each of these bits that you get convey a lot of information. You can actually use the fact that you get n bits when you measure them. This has been explored already, and this is something that my good friend Peter Zola is working actively on. So Peter and me collaborate a lot, but this is more Peter's turf, and I think he can do it better than me. But what he is essentially saying, he has a different approximation framework, that is not universal, kind of like with this digital framework, you can predict anything, but he has special purpose formulas for things like the purity, the global purity, or the reduced purity, where you don't really need to know and store the actual unitary. So you again do randomized measurements, but now you do more than one, you do a couple of them, and then you compare the bit screen statistics of the outcome you obtain, and if you do that in a correct way, you get an approximation for the purity as long as you sometimes change these global unitaries and their scrambles. And this is something that many body physicists can approximate by doing chaotic evolutions. Time dependent chaotic evolutions where you kick the system first in one direction and then in a different direction. And if you do this long enough, 
you can show that the process effectively converges to a scrambling unitary, and then you can use Peter's formulas that don't have the drawback of needing an exact classical approximation for certain properties. It's really cool and complementary work in the same spirit. Okay, so uh, that's, well, let me say a few things first, like, uh, um, well, on behalf of all the organizers and students, um, yeah, thank you, like, uh, I know how busy you are, like, uh, so it's a really honor that you accepted uh, our invitation. Uh, we met, like, a, a decade ago, he was just a kid, so it's really, uh, it has been a, a privilege to see how far you've gone, so, Thank you very much. Thanks for adopting me into the Palachi family. Yeah. Better late than never. You are, you are part of it now, yeah. Well, so uh, Marcel will present something now and just